Hello and welcome, Warhammer fans. My name is Poohhead189, longtime Warhammer fan, Total War gamer, and first time YouTuber. To commemorate this grand campaign map of Mortal Empires and the introduction of the High Elves in the Old World, as well as being an avid dwarf fan, I'm going to be talking about the war that shaped the two races as they are today and sets the stage for any conflicts they might have. Today, we're going to be talking about the War of Vengeance. The War of Vengeance, or the War of the Beard to the High Elves, was a catastrophic conflict that lasted nearly half a millennia. Men will call this the War of the Ancients because at the time, the men of the Empire, as well as the other, old, the other men in the Old World, like the Bretonians and the Kislevites, were merely cave-dwelling tribesmen. Now this conflict occurred about 2,000 years before Sigmar Heldenhammer was born. The Dwarfs and the High Elves were at the zenith of their power, the High Elves at this time being a large presence in the Old World. The Dwarfs held about every inch of the World Edge Mountains, which stretched further north than Kislev and down south past Araby and into the lower Southlands proper, as well as much of the land around the mountains as well. The Elves controlled Ulthuan, half of the Old World, ports and portions of Lustria, the Southlands, and perhaps even further. In fact, you could call the War of Vengeance the first and only actual world war of Warhammer fantasy, excluding the Chaos Incursions, of course. Now, as stated, roughly 2,000 years before Sigmar was born, the Elves and Dwarves were living in relative peace. Some might even call them comrades, though the two races have always been so different, many would say the war would have occurred eventually anyway. While they both traded together and shared boundaries, the two races still weren't the greatest of friends. The elves thought the dwarves lesser beings, while the dwarves thought the elves untrustworthy and flighty in their nature. You wouldn't see a dwarf making an elf the best man at his wedding, for instance. But the dwarves and elves had oaths of alliance after the last incursion of chaos, and they still held strong. So, despite their differences, why did they go to war? Why... Why would the two most powerful factions in the world start fighting each other after having been allied for hundreds, if not thousands, of years? The true mastermind of the conflict, or at least the one who sparked it, was the Witch King Malekith. And for those unfamiliar with Malekith, he was the son of the first and greatest Phoenix King in Arian, the Phoenix Kings being the High Kings of the Elves, uh, uh, Hunarian, who did not inherit his father's throne. So Malekith did not inherit his father's throne because the elves are kind of, have kind of an elective monarchy. So one thing led to another, and he tried to take it by force, the throne that is, in the elven civil war known as the Sundering. Uh, once that failed, he and his new dark elves traveled to the land of Chill known as Nagaroth, the Warhammer equivalent of North America, uh, to then conduct raids and find ways of returning to Ulthuan to conquer it. Ulthuan being the High Elves uh, island. Now, the Witch King had failed multiple times in trying to conquer Ulthuan, and he was still licking his wounds from the last incursion. Granted, he had regained a lot of his previous strength, but he knew he needed something more to take control of the island nation. He had just kept failing, so he devised a plan, using the High Elves' greatest weakness against them, a weakness Malekith was well aware of, arrogance. As I said earlier, the High Elves, though allied with the Dwarves, thought them lesser creatures, and because of that fact, they remained about as insular as the Dwarves did, and thought it was no business of the Dawi, or another word for Dwarf, uh, to be privy to the information that there was a great sundering, and a splitting of the Elven race. So essentially, the Dwarves had no idea that there were Dark Elves. All Elves were the same to them. And you know, you'd think the elves would have learned the error of their ways, but even in the modern Warhammer world, much of the Empire still views the elves with disdain because they believe the dark elves that raid the old world and take villagers as slaves are actually high elves from Ulthuan. Anyway, due to this shortcoming of not trusting the dwarfs with such pertinent news, the dark elves acted upon that lack of information and began small-scale assassination missions. They attacked dwarf caravans with elven arrows. To make it worse, they would shear off the beards of the traveling dwarf merchants and dismember their corpses. Now, the dwarf afterlife is a very complicated and particular subject, but in essence, there are plenty of ways for dwarves to be shamed and cursed to wander the halls of limbo, rather than join the ancestor gods at their table.
If a dwarf is not given certain rites by their priests, for instance, if the bodies are not buried in stone, if they can help it at least, sometimes they give leeway with the lore, um, or if the bodies are particularly dismembered after death, uh, like losing their beards. Um, the dwarves who are shamed are cursed until their dishonor and their grudges have been settled. So as you can see, the attacks on the caravans and the desecration of the dwarf bodies was a very large offense. Now let's talk about the catalyst for the war and the leaders of both factions. For the dwarves, uh, the stubborn and powerful High King Gotrek Starbreaker. For the elves, the arrogant but martially skilled Kaldor II, named the Warrior. Now, after years of assassinations and raids on caravans, um, the dwarves had seen enough dwarf blood spilled, and so they sent emissaries to Ulthuan to find the reason for these attacks. Unfortunately, in Kaldor II's arrogance, all of the so-called mud dwellers were, turn were turned back wanting. Uh, no diplomat was taken seriously, nor treated cordially or with any kind of respect. Many dwarf lords wished for all-out war, and smaller settlements between the two races had already erupted in smaller, regional wars and pitched battles. But thankfully, cooler heads prevailed, and Gotrek Starbreaker sent one last emissary to the court of the Phoenix King demanding an apology for the dwarf losses and recompense this for this grave dishonor of their pact of friendship. When the emissary demanded this of Kaldor II, the Phoenix King, well, his reply was not something that Gotrek had hoped for. He said in no uncertain terms that the dwarf may beg or humbly request, but no lesser being would ever demand something from him. He then had the dwarf seized, and with a stroke of his sword, cut the dwarf emissary's beard off. This was the gravest offense Kalidor could have given, and Gotrek Starbreaker had no choice but to call for all-out war on the High Elves. Within a year, the dwarf forces were mobilized, and the dwarf uh, war machine began its advance. The High Elves were taken by surprise in all honesty. They had no idea the dwarves would attack because of a beard and an insult but attack they did. The initial dwarf offensive was so unrelenting that within 20 years, the dwarves had swept over all elven mainland resistance and pushed the elves back to their last great port city in the old world, Torlesi. Now, this is a very important city for both the high elves and the war in general, and it's located in, I hope I'm pronouncing this right, in what we know today is the city of Languili, um, La Anguili, on the northern coast of Bretonia. It was the main hub of most elven commerce between Ulthuan and their mainland colonies. Now, while most of the lands and settlements between the World's Edge Mountains and the western coastline were either conquered or under siege by the dwarves, Torlesi would not be easy prey. The dwarves had been fighting for years at this point, and inside the city's high walls, overlooked by sorcerous towers of Safari, were 20,000 fighting elves. Now, let's have a quick chat on elven and dwarf armies. You see, despite the glaring differences in their culture um, that the two races have, they are actually quite similar in the ways they wage war. Both armies tend to be superb in melee, devastating at range, both being outfitted with plenty of magical or runic arms and armor, but of course they have a few differences as well. Uh, dwarves don't field any cavalry like the elves do, um, and they use different ways of magic. They use anvils of doom and runes rather than the better known spells of, that the elves use with their high magic. Um, and the dwarves also have a more powerful variety of siege weaponry. But one of the more notable aspects that both armies have in common is that the majority of both of their armed forces are made up of militia. Now that's not to say that they aren't skilled in battle. In fact, due to both dwarfs and elves living for centuries, and the average militia of either race having been drilled and seen battle far more than any man could hope for, the average citizen militia of either race is more disciplined and skilled than any professional imperial soldier. That being said, not all citizens are enlisted into military service. So with the number of fighting elves being 20,000, what does that say for the overall population of Torlesi? Well, let's look at the average population of fighting men from, his, from a historical human settlement. Generally speaking, 
the maximum strength of soldiers a settlement of humans could produce is one-fourth of the population. First things first, half of a settlement is composed of women, and historically speaking, women were not usually soldiers unless it was special circumstances. So, now, now that we have half of the initial population, we cut that half into half, because among the male population, there's going to be the very old, the very young, the very sick, the disabled, um, and those among the population with special skills that are more useful performing their duties at the settlement. With elves and dwarves, it's a bit different. Let's look at the high elves first. A high elf settlement can only be estimated in strength, but their culture tells us a lot of how many they could field in battle. First off, while the classical image of a female elf is the elven maiden that Tyrion, the elven hero, saves, or the ones that can sing and dance and draw your gaze with their graceful beauty, the High Elves are far less of a stickler to gender roles when it, com um, when it comes to combat than men and dwarfs, or gender roles for any of their society, really. So while a lot of High Elf women do have, um, you know, more mundane tasks and many can be exempt from military service, there is no shortage of elven females in frontline fighting either, um, though likely you'll see most of them in a magical support role. Um, the high elves also have less of a chance than humans do with pesky things like debilitating illnesses and mutations. So an elven settlement can probably use up to nearly half of its population for military service. Probably two-fifths of the population, if not half. Now let's look at a dwarf settlement just for flavor, um, you know, for a contrast. It's a very rare thing for a dwarf family to give birth to a girl, and because of that, three-fourths or even um, four-fifths um, sometimes of the dwarf population would be male um, rather than half. So that already skyrockets the settlement's potential for military recruits. Also, the dwarf race is naturally dour and grim, and they train almost the entire male population in warfare. Coupled with the fact that unlike elves or men, all dwarfs are natural craftsmen, and there would be very few with the special abilities that would, you know, need to be left behind, uh, because nearly all of them have superb skill. And finally, the dwarf physiology. Dwarves have virtually no population that is too old or too sick to fight. Um, for the sickness, a disease that could topple an imperial city wouldn't even make a dwarf cough. And a dwarf uh, naturally grows bigger and stronger rather than weaker as they age. Uh, like reptiles, oddly enough, it's only at a breaking point in their lives do they suddenly grow frail and deteriorate. And when that happens, they have a very short amount of time to live. Um, but still, for most of their lives, they're simply growing bigger, stronger, and tougher. All of this means that it isn't unfeasible for a dwarf settlement to have over three-fifths of the population um, for military service. So, if Torlesi boasts 20,000 elven soldiers, and we're going back to um, the elven statistics, um, we can give a fair estimate to the city's population as a whole which is likely around 50,000 elves, which is about the size of uh, 14th century London. So while not a metropolis, it's a huge city in both size and significance. Now, on to the battle. The dwarfs began their assault by attacking the Western Gate with grudge throwers, which are accurate and powerful dwarf catapults. Um, black powder weaponry had not yet been invented, so the dwarf artiller artillery was limited to grudge throwers, uh, bolt thrower ballistas, and um, dwarf crossbowmen for anti-personnel firepower, also known as quarrelers. Uh, while long-ranged and powerful, that didn't necessarily mean they outranged the elven bolt throwers or magic, and the devastating longbows the LG had, uh, LG meaning elf, uh, could maintain heavy returning firepower for when the quarrelers got close to the walls. 1,500 stones imbued with runes of vengeance and wall breaking assailed the walls and towers of Torlesi. Arrows and crossbow bolts being traded between both armies. Three times the elves sallied forth from their walls on their war horses to assail the artillery crews, 
using swift raids with their lances to inflict casualties before riding back under the protection of their longbows and then back into their walled city. The second day of the siege, the dwarfs began three different mining tunnels to undermine the towers of the gatehouse, named Thom, Grick, and Ari, respectively. Uh, the dwarfs began to dig with swift precision, protected from elven longbows with large pavises made from wootruff, which is a very rare and sturdy type of mountain tree that's favored by the dwarfs. The next three days were bloody, thousands of arrows and bolts being exchanged. It was on the sixth day during the mining of Grick that magical elven fire reduced it to rubble. During this cataclysm, Another host of elves sallied forth once more and destroyed the workings of Thom. However, the dwarfs were ready for, for this group of elves, and they slaughtered them and captured their leader, who named himself Prince Arlir, because what elf isn't a prince? Uh, Gotrek Starbreaker ordered both Grick and Thom to be halted, since they were pretty much destroyed, and all efforts to be focused on Ari. Under covering bombardment of enchanted bolt throwers and rune-carved boulders, Ari was completed and fire was then set to it, which toppled the rightmost tower of the western gatehouse of Toralesi, crushing many elves. The walls were breached, and the dwarf ironbreakers strode forward. The elves in the city counterattacked, streaming through the breach with silver steel. The ironbreakers held them back and even pushed forward, setting fire to parts of the city until unsettling news reached the High King. A great host of warships from Ulthuan had been sighted a few miles offshore. The full strength of Ulthuan had come. Not wanting to be caught between Tor Alessi, who still had some fight left in it, and the Ulthuan host, Gotrek Starbreaker reluctantly retreated his forces. The elves of Tor Alessi cheered at the retreat, only for their cries of joy to die on their lips when the headless corpse of the captured Prince Arlir was sent back through the gates on his horse. Thus, with the city half in ruins but many dwarvish siege engines abandoned on the field, did the first siege of Torlesi end. For the next twenty-three years, the elves mobilized and the war escalated in earnest, though the dwarfs still pressed forward. Torlesi was besieged two more times, and the dwarf hold of Karak Azul was attacked. Bloody was the cost on both sides. The dwarves of Karak Eight Peaks were estimated to have lost at least 18,000 dwarf soldiers during these beginning years. The advance of the dwarves was halted in the year 1954 before Sigmar, and the elves began a counterattack that lasted 150 odd years. At the onset of this elven advance, where they retook much of the lands that were lost from the initial dwarfish push, the High King himself wrote another grudge in blood from the elves' attack on Angaz Baragdum. We don't exactly know where that is located in modern Warhammer terms, but we can safely assume it was not one of the dwarf holds in the mountains, probably a foothill or a vassal area close to the realm. The significance of the battle was not in its location, nor was it even in its outcome. It was what occurred during the battle that not only affected that outcome, but the tone of the war. And to, and to look at what happened, we must first take a look at who led the forces of both armies. For the dwarves, they were led by Snorri Halfhand, the son of Gotrek Starbreaker. Now, Snorri was considered young and impetuous by his peers, particularly by his best friend and cousin Morgrim, who himself was the son of a lesser king. We'll talk about Morgrim soon enough. Uh, but Snorri was called Halfhand because he had lost a portion of one of his hands deep in the underway by one of the first encounters Dwarfdom ever had with the Skaven, a race that was now barely out of its crib and still very rare and animalistic. Snorri was given leave by his father to control a portion of the Dwarf forces at this time of the war, and at this battle he performed well at the onset. In fact, he performed well in its entirety, eventually surrounding the elf forces and pushing them back nearly destroying them. But of course, Calador II, the Phoenix King of Ulthuan, could not let an army of mud dwellers win the day. You see, he was the commander of the opposing army, and this was his first appearance in the war and would be his last uh, for another 300 more years. So, near the end of the battle, Snorri saw the accursed Phoenix King behind his lines, and due to his desire to end the war in its entirety, and to prove himself to his father, 
he halted the dwarven assault of his army and called a duel between he and Calidor. Now, Calidor was known for his arrogance and his utter dismissal of the dwarf people as adversaries. He was so arrogant, he didn't even realize that his army was losing. Um, so he didn't think this, was, this would be any big deal to accept a challenge from Snorri, so he accepted. Now, what happened next is subject of some debate. Some believe Snorri was performing the proper dwarfish rites one did before a duel. Some think Snorri simply wasn't prepared in general, not giving a reasonable answer when the duel began. But what is known is simple. Calidor, armed with his spear, struck Snorri half-hand before the duel had truly commenced. Uh, perhaps Calidor knew the duel had not begun and struck, or perhaps he did not know the dwarf rituals and assumed Snorri was already ready. However, it is known he did not relent his attack and he pressed forward, his spear like a striking viper. Now, Snorri Halfhand was not the greatest dwarf warrior, but he was competent and he did his best to block the swift assault by the sneering Phoenix King. But after a few blows, Kaldor impaled Snorri's hip into the ground with his spear tip, and drawing his magic sword, he cleaved through Snorri's breastplate, opening the dwarf's stout chest in a fountain of thick dwarf blood killing the dwarf prince. Unceremoniously, Kaldor then hacked off Snorri's arm and pranced around the battlefield with his grisly trophy. This made the dwarf army lose all interest of fighting that day, and what remains of Snorri they could gather, they returned to Karak Eight Peaks. So as Gotrek Starbreaker wrote a new grudge in blood, Kaldor II returned to Ulthuan, satisfied with the victory. These dwarves weren't formidable. He defeated the Dwarf Prince so easily. He pretty much told the other elves that they could mop up the remaining Dwarf forces and he'll be back in Ulthawan, just lock the door on the way back in. As we all know, victory would not be won as easily as the arrogant Phoenix King predicted. 1,804 years before Sigmar, the aggressive elven counterattack slowed. They had lost too many elves and they exhausted their resources, finding the Dwarf Holds too difficult to conquer by martial skill. Two more failed attempts of besieging Karaza Karak itself later, the dwarfs won a major victory at Oregar in the foothills west of Karak Israel. While the elves often pride themselves on being a mobile force, surprisingly the dwarfs won the battle through maneuvering and gaining a better position on the battlefield. During the fight, just as in Angaz Baragdum, the leaders of both dwarf and elf forces met on the field. For the dwarfs, Morgrim Balgrim, the nephew of Gotrek Starbreaker and close friend to the now deceased Snorri Halfhand. He was known as a particularly powerful warrior and a wise dwarf prince. The elven commander was not dissimilar in these regards. Imladric, prince of Ulthuan, was known for his honor and skill in battle, and was one of the few elves the dwarves could claim to somewhat respect. In fact, Morgrim had known him briefly before the war, and they had respected one another, the elf even offering a ride for the dwarf, along with Snorri, to the dwarf capital on Imladric's dragon. However, as cousin to Kaldor II, and due to his inactions of, of the war, as well as failing to stop Kaldor from shearing the beards that began the conflict, Imladric was seen just as guilty as Kaldor, and his death was demanded by honor. 5,000 elves lost their lives that day, and Imladric, with a bravery that impressed the dwarfs, led the charge against the, the Dawi front lines, slaying many dwarfs with his gleaming magical blade. And yet, it was to be his doom. For when Morgrim met Imladric on the field, he cut the head off Imladric's griffin with a great blow from his axe. To his credit, Imladric recovered quickly. But his sword could not pierce Morgrim's armor, nor could he find equal footing against the, ra the rage of Morgrim that day. The dwarf struck the elf on the head, killing him after a fierce duel. Unlike Kalidor, who maimed Snorri by cutting his arm off and prancing around with it, Morgrim showed great restraint and merely removed Imladric's nose, and even allowed Im Imladric's retainers to collect the rest of his remains for a proper burial. For this great victory that proved he was now worthy of being Gotrek Starbreaker's heir, along with the slaying of the great elf warrior and his griffin steed, Morgrim Balgrim became Morgrim Elgidum, meaning Elf Doom. Later, an elven messenger was killed by dwarf rangers near, near Gotrek bin Gazan, who was taking a message to the elven army camped at Shadowmere. The message offered the hand in marriage of Kaldor's sister to whatever elf killed Morgrim. <laughs> 
another grudge was made for this assassination contract. After Morgrim Elgidum's victory there, the elves decided to attack Karaz Azul once more to get revenge. This battle is not well documented, but the siege was nearly victorious due to the elves' weight of numbers. But the dwarves were rallied by a dwarf miner called Brock Stonefist, who bore the alias the Nightmare of the Deeps. It's not specified on if the moniker was gained from this battle or beforehand. Either way, he won a great victory there, synonymous with Morgrim's, and the two became the greatest and most well-known generals of the war. To combat the new threat of Brock Stonefist, the elves sought their greatest tactician, Salandor. Not much is known of Salandor other than him being hailed as a military genius, and the two dueled over countless battles across the old world, coming to a head at the last turning point of the war, the siege of Athel, Ma Ma sorry, Athel Mariah. Twenty years after Imladric was killed by Morgrim, Athel Mariah was destroyed in a great battle during the year 1778 before Sigmar. A great train of war machines was brought from Karak Eight Peaks, Karaza Karak, Karaz Azul, Karak Varn, and Karak Kadrin. The elves were given free passage to go once the dwarves fully surrounded the city, but they refused, stubborn in their defiance. Now, the initial lore of the battle state says in no uncertain terms that the dwarves burned the city to the ground, but the novelization of the battle treats the burning of the city as an accident by the dwarves which I will take with a huge grain of salt. Novels are always known for making the actual lore a bit weird for entertainment purposes, so we're going to go with the established lore for this. But nevertheless, Salandor and Brock Stonefist, still within the city, fought each other uh, to the death as the towers burned and crumbled around them. Now, with the destruction of Athel Mariah, the dwarfs now stood upon the brink of the, of the turning tide and they began to tighten the noose. The next great battle listed in the histories was the last, the 14th Siege of Tor Alesi, though there is some discrepancy of the dating. The war ended in the year 1560 before Sigmar, yet the last Siege of Tor Alesi was fought in the year 1628 before Sigmar, according to the math from when Kalidor made his last appearance in the Old World to now. To explain... Kalidor killed Snorri Halfhand and demoralized the dwarf army the prince commanded, and he just up and went home. He went back to Ulthuan, thinking the dwarf's an easy foe for his armies. He pretty much told his generals to mop up the mess. Over the next three centuries, he sat around in Ulthuan and ruled the island, until one day he asked, where is everybody? And the answer he got he didn't like. Not only was the whole of his army still in the old world fighting the dwarfs, but they were fighting a losing war. His cousin Imladric was, had been slain, and his most tactically brilliant general Salandor was now dead as well. Kalidor II couldn't believe the incompetence of his army and grew frustrated with his generals. He pretty much said if you needed to get something done, do it yourself. He said, fine, fuck it, I'll head back to the Old World and I'll beat the dwarfs myself again. So he sailed back into the Old World, 346 years since he last left it. The Phoenix King was a fine warrior, but he was not the best strategist and too arrogant to listen to those who were. He led the forces of the elves at the 14th siege of Torlesi. Fireballs and lightning rained down from the walls along with elven arrows. The ground was rent asunder with great fissures, swallowing up whole, whole siege batteries and crews. The dwarves were having none of it, however. They stood firm against the power unleashed before them, and they had brought magic of their own. Three anvils, anvils of doom, and the runesmiths to use them brought forth mighty magics in reply. Kalidor decided to send the elven army outside the walls to assault the dwarf, the dwarf lines, making three pushes in order to attempt breaking the dwarf army. Thrice the dwarves pushed them back. It was the fourth assault when Kaldor II joined the fray, riding upon his mighty red dragon, trying to charge the dwarf high king's position. It was with quarrel and bolt thrower that tore the wings of the dragon, sending it to the ground and unhorsing Kaldor as it were. The Phoenix King was not dead, however. In fact, he was relatively unhurt. But that was also when Gotrek Starbreaker, the High King, met the Phoenix King Kalidor in single combat. After the High King slew the elves that went to Kalidor's position, they met axe to sword. Now, what happened next is a matter of some debate. Some sources suggest the two battled for hours. Others suggest three days as the battle raged around them. Some suggest Gotrek Starbreaker utterly tore Kaldor a new one, but one thing was clear to Kaldor II by the end of the fight. 
Gotrek Starbreaker was more experienced in single combat than his son. Kalidor's sword was shattered, and he begged for his life. A request Gotrek Starbreaker promptly denied and beheaded the Phoenix King before the Elven army's eyes. The High King did not dismember the corpse, or even spit on it. He did something far worse, actually. Um, something to repair the honor of the Dwarf Kingdoms and a repayment for the art atrocities the Elves had committed during the war. He knelt down and removed the phoenix crown from Kaldor's decapitated head. He announced the deed is done and promptly told his army that the war was over, satisfied at the victory they had won here today and telling the elves that if they wanted the artifact back, they could try to take it back from Carrick Eight Peaks. And about the war, who was to argue with them? The elves were demoralized and pushed to the sea. The dwarfs had the numbers, the strength, and now the phoenix crown. This leads me to believe the year 1628 was the year the dwarfs considered the war done with, while the elves were of a different mind. You see, the elven princes that were left began to discuss among themselves what they were to do about what they perceived to be the theft of the phoenix crown. Even though all historians agree that to assault the dwarfs now would be suicide for the elves, and it would break the back of what remained of the elven forces, they were still considering it. In the greatest twist of irony across these long centuries, it was Malekith, the one whose machinations started the war to weaken the elves, who's the one that saved them from utter destruction. Because he attacked Ulthawan then, at that time, as soon as he heard that Kaldor II was dead, thinking that the elven army was too weak to resist him and too scattered with the Phoenix King now gone. And so to defend their homeland, what remained of the armies of the elves in the old world departed. Now, some of the elves decided to stay because they felt more kinship with the old world than Ulthawan, and these elves fled into the cursed forest of Athol Lorin to escape the wrath of the dwarves and the growing numbers of beastmen and orcs, and they became the high elves, I mean, sorry, the, the um, they became the wood elves, but that was essentially the end of the war. The elves returned to Ulthawan and fought off the Dark Elves, and to this day, the Phoenix Crown still resides within the vaults of Karak Eight Peaks. And thus ended the War of Vengeance. Thank you so much for watching, and I hope you all have a great day.